If you are traveling in an arid landscape with your friends a long time ago, and you're on a camel and your friends are on a camel and you've got a long journey ahead of you and you're using something in the sky to guide you, to give you direction and position so that you reach your destination. And it's a long journey. This is going to take more than two months. Would a star be more useful to you or would a comet be more useful to you? Which of these two heavenly phenomena would be more useful from a navigation point of view? I put it to you that perhaps a comet because it has a head and a tail. The Chinese astronomers were far more advanced than their Western counterparts. The Chinese, the Chinese astronomers, according to NASA, kept very meticulous records about comets when they appeared, when they disappeared. And they, these records were called comet atlases. And a typical comet atlas looks something like this. Doesn't mean much to an American or an Australian or an Englishman, but to the Chinese people, this is a detailed record of when a comet appeared in the sky and how long it lasted and when it appeared. On the 9th of March, 5 BC, this record appeared in the astronomy records of the Book of the Han Dynasty and translated into English. It reads in the second month of the second year of Yanping, the comet was out of Altair. Altair is a star. This comet came out of a star and it lasted for more than 70 days. And it is said comets appear to signify the old being replaced by the new. Altair, the sun, the moon and the five stars are in movement to signify the beginning of a new epoch the beginning of a new year, a new month and a new day. This is dated 9th of March, 5 BC. That's Altair. It's in the constellation of Aquila. It's the brightest star in the constellation of Aquila. And the Chinese astronomers are saying, on the 9th of March, 5 BC, this comet appeared out of, seemingly appeared out of this star, and it lasted for more than 70 days. The appearance of this comet undoubtedly symbolizes change, they said. The extended appearance of the comet for more than 70 days indicates that this is of great importance. And there's the reference on the screen. The Bible says the wise men who came to visit Jesus Christ, who was to be born in Bethlehem, they said, we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. The wise men thought it was a star. The Chinese astronomers who knew nothing about this thought it was a comet. To them, it looked like a comet. To the wise men, it looked like a star. This record is dated 31 AD and it's in the history of the latter Han dynasty and there's the reference. And it says, summer, fourth month of the year on the day of Ren Wu, the imperial edict reads, yin and yang have mistakenly switched and the sun and the moon were eclipsed. The signs of all, the sins of all the people are now on one man. Pardon is proclaimed to all under heaven. They knew nothing about Jesus, and this is dated 31 AD. They knew nothing about Jesus Christ, but in their soul, in their spirit, they felt that this sudden eclipse of the sun unexpectedly meant that the sins of people were pardoned and had been placed on one man. That's amazing, isn't it? And then it goes on to say the eclipse on the day of Gui Hai, man from heaven died. 
How did the Chinese people know this? There in China, Jesus Christ was being crucified in Jerusalem. They knew nothing about it. But in their records, when they saw this eclipse, these imperial astronomers wrote, man from heaven has died. Then three days later, There was, an eclipse, there was a halo around the sun, 360 degree rainbow halo, three days later. During the reign of Emperor Guangwu on the day of Bin Ying of the fourth month of Yanwu, a halo, a rainbow, encircled the sun three days later. So, folks, here is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They didn't know what they were writing. They were simply recording what they saw not knowing what it meant. And so here, folks, to start off this amazing message tonight, we have three evidences where the Chinese astronomers, unknowing to them, pinpointed the year of Christ's birth, the year of his death, and three days later, his resurrection. And I hope if you're watching, I have now got your attention. Because this is the type of evidence that we're going to present. New to Western ears, new to Chinese listeners and Asian listeners. Perhaps you've never heard this before, but what you're going to hear tonight and for the rest of the message is even more amazing. The ancient Chinese have amazing contributions to make to the world. And they confirm the book of Genesis. They confirm the story of Genesis. And if Genesis is not true, folks, then you can throw the Bible away. Because if the first book is wrong, the other 65 books of the Bible are wrong. Because Genesis talks about sin and creation and the flood and the Tower of Babel. And if all those things are just a story and there's no reality there, then the whole Bible is wrong because the other 65 books of the Bible are based on the, the veracity of Genesis. So during this presentation, we're going to touch upon these four areas. What did the Chinese say about creation? What did the Chinese say about the fall of man? What did the Chinese say about the flood and the Tower of Babel? But we need a very quick lesson in Chinese tonight. For those of us who don't know Chinese, this is a mouth and the Chinese characters are not a hieroglyphic. The Chinese characters are a pictogram. And so when the Chinese see your open mouth, they say, well, the character that we're going to create for mouth is going to resemble a mouth. So there you have the first word, kao, which is mouth. It can mean a person. It can mean breath. It can mean a man. And this one is very obvious. This is a tree. And this one is two trees. So it can be a garden or it can be a forest or it can be two trees. And so when we put them together, we've got one person in a garden. You see that? Now that we understand Chinese, we can proceed. Let's look at something about the flood. The Bible says there were eight people who entered the ark, Noah and his wife, Noah's three sons, and Noah's three sons' wives. A total of eight entered the ark. The Chinese word for big boat is chuan. And it is made up of these components. A boat with the number eight, and what's that symbol at the bottom? That's mouth or per people. So we have a boat with eight people inside it. And this character is as old, almost as old as time itself. It goes back before Moses. It goes back to 2200 BC. Where did they get this from? How did they know there were eight people in the ark? They didn't get it from Moses. Now we'll pick something in creation. The Bible says God created 
man in his own image. He spoke and it was done. The word for create in Chinese or to make or to concoct or to put together something is thou. And it's made up of these components. Words were spoken. You see the open mouth? Words were spoken. And as words were spoken, movement happened. Now, I would have thought if I was going to create a Chinese character for create or to make, I would have had a pair of hands making something. What has spoken words got to do with movement happening all of a sudden? Because this this agrees with the Bible story. And this word is old. This is older than Moses. The Bible says God spoke and it was done. Talking about creation, the Bible says God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. That's what the Bible says. If we take this word zao apart, just that top bit that you see on the screen, just that top bit, take it apart, this is what we get. We get dust and we get breath, there's the mouth, and the result is something living. This is exactly what the Bible says. And this is the Chinese word for to make or for to create. The Chinese history goes back in an unbroken record of 4,500 years. That's very similar to the Hebrew race. An unbroken history of four and a half thousand years. They have records. They've kept uh, writing. Uh, There's no other civilization like the Hebrews and the Chinese. And uh, this is going to be very helpful as we unfold some of the truths tonight. The very first emperor of China is Huang Di. He's called the Yellow Emperor. Di means um, emperor and Huang means yellow. And this emperor reigned from 2500 BC, a thousand years before Moses, to 2400 BC. And it is attributed to him that all the Han Chinese people come from Huangdi. It's also attributed to him that Chinese, the Chinese writing system was developed. That's 2500 years BC we're talking. Moses lived around 1500 BC. A thousand years before Moses, Huangdi existed. And under his reign, a writing system was developed. You could almost say he's a bit like Abraham. From him came the Chinese people. But what sort of God were they worshipping? What sort of God did the ancient Chinese believe in? We think, well, uh, they're all into Taoism and Confucianism, and they're into Buddhism In China, yes, today, that is the case. That's predominantly the main religions of China. But these religions entered China around 600, 500 BC. And Huangdi lived 2500 BC. So the question I want to ask is, what sort of God were the ancient Chinese worshipping before Taoism and Buddhism and Confucianism came into China? There's a 2,000 year gap there. And the answer comes from China's greatest historian called Sima Chen. He is highly respected. He is highly revered. He is, very few criticize this man. And when he writes, people take it as fact. And he, he wrote that Huang Di built an altar in Taishan to worship a god that they called Shangdi. Di means emperor. So to them, their god was Emperor Shang. But it was their god. It wasn't a human being. And so they worshipped Shangdi a thousand years before Moses. Our second answer comes from Confucius and Summa Chen. Confucius wrote five classics of poetry. And Sima Chen wrote the historical records, highly respected. And both say that the people of the Shang dynasty worshipped 
Shangdi. Now, the Shang Dynasty goes back to 1776 BC when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea. 200, 300 years before that event, the Shang Dynasty was alive and well. And the Shang Dynasty is unique because they kept records, they kept documents. And when you can record things and document things, you can record history. Here is a, set, here is a picture of my Seventh-day Adventist friend, Victor Lee, holding a tortoise shell that is dated 1770 BC. And he's holding it. He should be holding it a lot more carefully, I would have thought. He's holding it with two fingers. It's very old. And on that tortoise shell is some very ancient Chinese writing. And this is how old it goes back to, 1770 BC. So when Moses was writing Genesis, 300 years before that, the Chinese were already writing. So there's the timeline. You can see Huangdi, 2500 BC. You can see the Shang Dynasty with the tortoise shell and the writing, 1770 BC. And Moses looks as though he's arrived a little bit late. He's arrived at 1500 BC. But the Chinese were already writing and recording and capturing concepts that are embedded in the Bible and it's embedded in their language. And if I was Chinese, I would be so proud tonight. I would be so proud because you got there first. You had biblical concepts in your language before the Jews, before the Hebrews, before Moses. And so you can see that Taoism and Confucianism and Buddhism, they came very late. They came very late. And so here is the letter for Shangdi. There is no image of him. There is no sculpture of him. There is no idol of him because they didn't believe in idolatry. They just wrote a character to describe Shangdi. We know the Hebrews worshipped Yahweh or Jehovah or Elohim. The Chinese worship Shangdi. And I want to put it to you tonight that Shangdi and Jehovah or Yahweh are the same. I'm going to show you proof and evidence from Confucius that, they, that Shangdi has the same characteristics of Yahweh. In his Five classics. Confucius describes 175 references to Shangdi. And we're not going to go through them all tonight. We'd be here forever. But I'll give you some descriptors from the five classics of Shangdi. Shangdi is described by Confucius as a God who's all powerful, a God who has authority over all nations, a God who is all knowing, a God who is ever present. You might say, well, that could be anybody. That could be any pagan god. Most pagan gods claim this. But wait, there's one descriptor that sets Shangdi apart from all the pagan gods, and that is that Shangdi is a god of love, and that is very unique. This is not a pagan god. This is the same god as the god of the Bible. This is the same god as Yahweh. And so, to summarize some of those recitations of Shangdi, he is a God of justice and wisdom and grace and holiness and faithfulness and mercy and righteousness and he's eternal. These are the characteristics of Yahweh. These are the characteristics of the God of the Bible. And so Shangdi and Yahweh are the same. Now Huangdi, we are told, built an altar to worship Shangdi. And every year, every year, the ancient Chinese people had a major event, a major religious event called the Border Sacrifice. And it was moved every, according to where the capital city of China was of that time, wherever the capital city was, 
That's where they had it. And this happened every year. Imagine all the Christians in the world getting together into one place every year to worship God. This is what the Chinese were doing. They met every year, huge crowds to worship Shangdi. And Confucius tells us the ceremonies of the celestial and terrestrial sacrifices are those by which men serve Shangdi. And on that day, the emperor became priest. Now, this is very similar to the Day of Atonement of the ancient Hebrews, where they met once a year. And the high priest became priest and represented all the people. And here the ancient Chinese emperor, the king, became priest and he offered blood sacrifice as atonement to Shangdi. And if you go to south of Beijing today, southern Beijing, you'll have this massive complex, the temple of heaven and the altar of heaven. There's the temple of heaven. There are no idols in there. There are no statues in there. There's the altar of heaven where this blood, blood sacrifice used to be offered once a year. And then suddenly it all came to an end. This emperor, Qin Shi Huang, in 259 BC, he put an end to the worship of Shangdi. And he said, no more blood sacrifice to Shangdi. And he lowered the boom and he stopped it. And this is why Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism began to flourish. And it's still flourishing in China today. If the Chinese people only understood that you were worshipping the same God as the God of the Bible, you would look at this again through intelligent eyes, through discerning eyes, and see that it is in your history, it's in your culture, and it is this emperor, Qin Shi Huang, who stopped it. So if we put it on a time chart, you can see the lineup. Huangdi, 2500 BC, the Shang Dynasty, 1770 BC, with the oracle, bone script, the writing, the ancient writing on those tortoise shells. Moses, 1500 BC, and the religions of China, they started to come in 500 BC. Now here is my friend Victor Lee holding this very old tortoise shell. And on that tortoise shell are inscribed very ancient Chinese characters dated to 1770 BC. They call them oracle bone script. Why oracle? The writing was on bone, animal bone, or it was on tortoise shell. So what's oracle got to do with it? Well, what they used to do, they would heat the tortoise shell or they would heat the animal bone with these characters on it. And then the, the tortoise shell would crack or the bone would crack. And depending on the formation of the cracks in relation to the characters written on it, they would start to tell your fortune or they would start to tell an oracle. And so it's called oracle bone script. But where no heat is applied, it is simply called bone or shell script. And it goes back to 1770 BC. Is that clear? It was written on bone or shell or pottery and even on axe heads. They're starting to discover ancient writing on Chinese axe heads. And they're now dating this to 2200 BC. So the Chinese writing goes back further than the Shang Dynasty. The Chinese writing is older than just oracle bone script. And there's the evidence. And the Chinese archaeologists are now pushing back the origin of Chinese characters by a thousand years. They thought it was around 1500 BC, 1200 BC. That's as old as it got. But now they're saying it's older than that by a thousand years. Why is that important? Because it means that these characters that have Bible concepts in them predate Moses. 
They didn't copy it from Moses, and Moses didn't copy it from them. It was given to them by word of mouth after the Tower of Babel when the people dispersed. Here is a website called China View, and it says new technology discovery rewrites earliest Chinese character dating, 2200 BC. So this is probably new to many listeners who always thought that Chinese writing is no older than 1200 BC, maybe 1500 BC, and at a stretch, at a stretch, 1700 BC. But now Chinese archaeologists are saying it's a lot older than that. So Huang Di, who lived 2500 BC, who under his reign developed a Chinese writing system, and everybody thought that's a bit of an exaggeration. People thought that was a story just made up to make him look famous. But the archaeologists are now saying, yes, there was Chinese writing around the time of Huang Di. So just to sum up, we have shell and bone script. It's dated 2200 BC. No oracle, no heat applied, no cracking of the media. Then we have oracle script, 1770 BC. And the characters on the oracle bone script are identical to the characters on the non-oracle bone script. They didn't invent a whole new set of characters for oracle bone. It's the same set of characters. And from oracle bone characters come classical Chinese characters. And from classical Chinese characters comes Cantonese and Mandarin. Can you see the pedigree? So what we're going to look at tonight is classical Chinese characters, because most people who are Chinese, watching, viewing, can understand these characters. You can't read oracle bone script, but you can read traditional Chinese. But even that's becoming a rare thing in China, as the younger generation is now focusing on the modern script. And the classical script comes from oracle bone, oracle bone. And oracle bone comes from non-oracle bone. So the pedigree for classical Chinese is go, goes right back to 2200 BC. Now in 2009, the Chinese government opened a museum in Anyang called the Chinese Character Museum. And I'm glad they did because everything I'm telling you tonight can be verified if you go to this museum. And it's a magnificent structure a museum dedicated to Chinese characters, a museum dedicated to the heritage and culture of Chinese writing. Here is my friend Victor Lee, Seventh-day Adventist, Christian, holding that oracle bone script written on tortoiseshell. And here he is standing in the Chinese Character Museum. This is, looks like the Great Wall of China, doesn't it? This enormous wall that houses oracle bone characters and the classical Chinese character equivalent. This is a Seventh-day Adventist researcher, Dr. Ethel Nelson, who wrote a book on this very subject called God's Promises to the Chinese. And she is a pathologist and she's an author and she meticulously traces the history of oracle bone script in relationship to biblical concepts. But the world doesn't know about it. And that's why tonight we're recording this program and broadcasting it to get the message out. And I take my hat off. I salute the Chinese people for your culture and your heritage and your history and your Chinese characters, which contain Bible truths, Bible concepts. Here is an oracle script that means woman. Very old script. This is probably 1770 BC, if not older. And next to it is the character for desire or to covet or to have greed in your heart. That's the oracle bone script for that concept. And there's the classical word. You can see there is a similarity. There are two little trees above the woman. 
The woman is below the trees, and it's the same in the classical character. So let's take the classical Chinese character for to desire something and to covet something and to have greed in your heart. There's the classical character, and it comes from this oracle bone script, which is dated 70, 1770 BC, and it's made up of two trees with a woman kneeling under them. The Bible says when Eve, the woman, committed the first sin, she had a choice between the tree of life, says the Bible, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees, not four or three, two. And this ancient Chinese character that's older than Moses puts the woman under two trees. Isn't that amazing? That's exactly what the Bible says. And so here we are today, and we're going back in time 4,200 years to when shell script and bone script were produced, and before that was Huangdi in 2500 BC, and the Shang Dynasty in 1770 BC. I'm just summarizing so you can put it all together. And there's Moses, 1500 BC, 700 years before Moses. The Chinese had developed characters that carry the Bible story. This is not an American import. Christianity is not an invention of the Americans. Christianity is not an invention of people in Australia or New Zealand or even the Middle East. Christianity is embedded in your culture and in your language and in your characters. And if you go to that Chinese character museum in Anyang, you will see that. And your current religions, which I respect, came a lot, lot later than your original religion. And so you were worshipping one supreme God called Shangdi, the creator of heaven and earth. And you did not copy this from Christian missionaries. You did not get this from a Christian evangelist who came to China. Because the first Christians to go to China was in 620 AD. Long after you had already developed your character language. So there they are, the Christian missionaries coming in very late, long after you'd already developed your writing. And so we can say that once you know how to write, you can start documenting history. You can start recording things if you know how to write. And we're going back to 2200 BC. And so you can write about how many bags of rice you have in your shed. You can write about how many donkeys you have or how many sheep you have. These are mundane, trivial things. But when something major happens, like the creation of the world, or the entry of sin into the world, or the fall of man and the flood, Noah's Ark, and the Tower of Babel. These are big events. These are headline events. When things like that happen, you would be recording that, would you not think, if you can write and record they did. Let's look at creation. The Bible says in Genesis, God blessed Adam and Eve, saying, be fruitful and multiply. The Chinese word for blessed is fu, and fu means good fortune, prosperity. If you're running a business, you're a Chinese businessman, you will probably have this letter above your business place because it means, may I be profitable, may I experience good fortune. But the word blessed has these components. God, together with one person with a mouth, there's the mouth, you see the little mouth shape, cow, in the garden. God and man have a relationship in a fruitful garden to have a fruitful family. And that's what the word blessed means. That's what the word prosperity means. Nothing to do with business. Nothing to do with making a lot of money. It's got everything to do with one person having a relationship with God and being, being blessed in that relationship. 
The Bible also says, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. The word for garden is yuen. And it is made up of these components, clay, breathing with a mouth. There's the cow symbol or the mouth symbol. Breath, clay breathing with a mouth on a man. And out of the side of the man comes a woman. Have a look. There's the, there's the woman coming out of the side of the man. Just as the Bible says that Eve, the woman, says the Bible was formed from a rib of the man came out of the side of the man. And your word for garden has this concept. The woman is coming out of the side of the man and then they are placed in the garden. And this is exactly what the Bible says. God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And this is in your word, garden. And it agrees with the Bible. Then the Bible says, the Lord commanded the man saying, of every tree in this garden, you can freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of this tree, because the day that you eat of it, you will die. And so the Chinese word for to forbid is tsing, and it is made up of two trees, and it is made up of the man getting a revelation, receiving a revelation about these two trees. This is the word for forbid. And so God gave the man, the Bible calls Adam, God gave this first man a revelation about these two trees, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God said, you can eat of any tree, but not this one. And this is embedded in the Chinese word to forbid. Let's look at something now about how sin and wrong and how evil came into the world, according to Chinese characters. The Bible says the serpent was more cunning than the beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. The word for tempter is mo, and it is made up of a garden, and then there was a, a movement in the garden and one came to a man and it was done secretly. So somebody came very secretly and sneakily to the man in the garden. And at this point, the word is gui, which means devil. And the devil came among two trees secretively, undercover. This is the Chinese word for tempter. And this is exactly what the Bible says, that the devil sneaked around and seduced and deceived and tricked the first man and woman. He didn't do it openly. He did it sneakily in a garden. Two trees are involved, exactly as the Bible says. Isn't that amazing? Then the Bible says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. The word for greed, we've already covered this. Remember when we went to the Oracle, the Chinese character museum in Anyang? The word for greed is lan. We looked at it earlier. And it's made up of two trees with the woman underneath. The woman fell into sin because of lust and greed, coveting and desiring. And this is embedded in your character, your word for greed and coveting and lusting. Then the Bible says the eyes of both of these people were opened and they knew that they were naked. The moment they sinned, they realized they were naked. And the word for naked is luo. And it is made up of clothing. Your clothing is gone when you eat of the fruit. What has fruit got to do with being naked? I would have thought if I was going to draw a picture of a naked person, I would just draw a stick person without clothing. But here this character for naked 
is embroiled in the concept of you're now naked because you ate a fruit. And that's the story of Genesis. And we read on, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Chinese word for to hide is juo, and it means his body is superimposed to the trees. He now looks like a tree. He's hiding behind a tree. You can't see him. He is hiding behind a tree because of the guilt of, sh of sin and the shame of sin. And the word for guilt is qui, and it's got to do with the heart, and the devil, gui, gets into your heart, and you feel guilty when the devil gets into your heart because of sin, and this is the Chinese word for guilt. The Bible says the Lord set a mark on Cain. Cain killed his brother, who was called Abel, because he was jealous that Abel's religious sacrifice was acceptable to God and his was not. And so jealousy consumed him. And he killed his brother, Cain. Now the word for brother in Chinese is ziong, and it looks like that. But the Chinese word for murder looks exactly the same, except it has a mark. And it's exactly the same word, ziong, pronounced the same. It's a different representation. But the murderer has a mark, and the murderer has a mark on his forehead. Do you see that? And that's exactly what the Bible says. It's exactly what the Bible says, and it's in your language. Where did it come from? Where did you get it from? Isn't it amazing? Let's go to the Tower of Babel. The word for tower is ta. Let's take the first bit. All the people were speaking was with one mouth and they were, they were united. They had one vision. They had, they had one language and they were united together. Then we take the second bit for tower and it says, all the people were speaking with one mouth and they took grass or they took straw and they took clay and they built something. The first time in Chinese writing that the word tower is created. It has to do with people who are in unity, who are building a tower with, out of bricks made of clay and straw. Isn't that amazing? Genesis tells us the whole earth had one language and one speech. And they said, let's build a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. That's in the Bible. And the Chinese word for confusion is Luan. And we break it down, we get your tongue with your right leg scattering in one direction. Because of the words that were spoken, the people were scattered. You see the, you see the mouth symbol there? Words were spoken, tongue was used, the right leg is scattered in one direction. And because of these spoken words, because of this confusion of language at the Tower of Babel, the people were scattered and confusion reigned. The word for scatter is fern sun. And there's the first bit, fern, and then we'll do the second bit. Fern means to divide. It's made up of the number eight. And with a knife, eight generations from creation to the Tower of Babel. And they were divided by the knife after eight generations. That's in that word, fern. Then we take the second bit, sun, which is dispel, and it is all the people in the flesh followed. All the flesh followed the people because of the confusion. And this is the word for dispel. So scatter, those two words together, fern sun. We looked at that. Generations were divided. 
Eight generations, from creation to the Tower of Babel, were divided by the knife. And all the flesh, all the people followed. That's the Chinese word for scatter. The Bible says it, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. From the Tower of Babel that the Bible talks about, this is where the Chinese people come from. Yes, Huang Di is your original ancestor. But where did Huang Di come from? He came from the Tower of Babel. And that's in the Middle East. And one group, after the scattering, they traveled to the east. The Chinese people originate from this group that traveled to the east. They migrated to the east. And the word for migrate is broken up and it means something big, big division from the West. And people were scattered. A big division from the West. You know, this is very funny. The Chinese people referred to the West as Westerners and they come from the East. But let me put it to you that you're the Westerner. The Chinese people are the true Westerners because you came from the West and you moved to the East and settled in China, but you came from the West. And this is in your word migrate. It says in the word migrate, you came from the West. From the West. Just as the Bible says. So Huang Di, we're familiar with him by now. He's a descendant from Babel. We've looked at these characters. We've seen how the writing system was developed under Huang Di, how the oldest writing is on shell bone and pottery pieces and axe heads and bone script. 2200 BC, we've seen that. We've seen that the truths of creation, the entry of sin, the flood, and the Tower of Babel, and the scattering are all embedded in your Chinese characters. And they can't be removed overnight. There'd be an awful lot of undoing to do. That you were ahead of the Hebrew people in terms of getting these truths embedded in your writing. Because the earliest writing of the Hebrew people is around the time of Moses. There's Moses in the Meridian Desert, in the Midian Desert, before the Exodus. He's a shepherd and he's writing the book of Moses, or the book of Genesis. Some say he wrote it after the Exodus. Doesn't really matter. 1500 BC. 1400 BC, it's not a lot. It's neither here nor there. Chinese writing goes back 2200 BC. And the Chinese are there in the Shang Dynasty under writing on oracle bone, 1770 BC, under Huang Di, Chinese writing system was developed long before Moses. Now, I don't want to end this meeting tonight without saying something about salvation. How did the Chinese people see salvation? How did your ancient ancestors see that they would be made right with God, how they would be made right with Shangdi, how they would be made right with Yahweh? How did you see that? Huang Di built this altar to worship Shangdi. And the word for sacrifice is Zi. And it's made up of a cow. And a lamb, you take a cow and you take a lamb and they must be without blemish. And that's exactly what the Holy Bible says, that Jesus, who this lamb represents, had to be without blemish, had to be without sin, had to be perfect, 
and that this cow and lamb without blemish was a symbol of Jesus Christ who was to come in the future without sin, without blemish. And he would be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And it's embedded in your language in the word sacrifice. And you kill this lamb and this cow without blemish with a spear and offer this as a sacrificial atonement to get at one with God again. And this is the truth of the Bible. This is what Jesus Christ came to do. And he did it on the cross. But it is embedded in your language. And I thank you for it. In Leviticus, in the Bible, the book written by Moses, he writes that you take an unblemished cow and you take an unblemished lamb and you offer it as a sacrifice representing Jesus Christ who was to come into the future and do exactly that. Jesus, Son of God, Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, unblemished, took the sin of mankind upon him to take away the sin of the world. He is the sacrifice. He is the unblemished Lamb. Now, the word for righteousness, I find this absolutely amazing. As a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I understand what righteousness means, what the gospel means when it comes to how you get it, how you get righteousness, but it is in your word for righteousness, ye, and is made up of a lamb. And then the lamb is over me. And that's the word for righteous. If I want to be right with God, I've got to make sure that I am covered by the lamb. The lamb is over me. I'm not over the lamb. And if I take the word apart just a little bit more, I get even more meaning. I learn if I take that bottom bit of the word ye, I get this you, with a hand and a spear is used against the lamb, against the lamb. And this word is 4,200 years old. 2,200 years before Jesus Christ died on the cross. Your Chinese character script had a word that captured the good news of the gospel where a spear was used against the innocent lamb representing our sins that killed the unblemished Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. Praise God. Christ's death on the cross prophesied in Chinese writing. Isn't that just amazing? So if we put it all on the chart, we can see that while the Egyptians were building the pyramids in Egypt, you had already developed a writing system that contained the great truths of Scripture. And I am just so excited about this. And I hope if you're watching or if you have a DVD that you get it into the hands of some of the government leaders in the People's Republic of China. Because I believe that if they see that they have this, this head start on the Hebrews, that they have the Bible concepts in their writing, that it's not an American import, that it's not a foreign religion, that it is embedded in your culture and writing. I believe if government leaders in China knew this, they would open the doors to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus to the Chinese people. All these great truths, the lamb being pierced, blood sacrifice and righteousness by faith, being washed clean and eternal life, these are all embedded in your characters. And I recommend for those who want more reading to get this book by Dr. Ethel Nelson. You can get it online, Amazon.com. God's promise to the Chinese. And for those who want more reading, there's another one called God and the Ancient Chinese by Dr. Ethel Nelson. 
her second book. And for those who want even more reading, there's another book, Chinese Traditions and Beliefs by Daniel Tong, a Christian writer. And for those who want even more evidence, I want to do more reading. There's a 200-page manuscript dated 1852 by the Reverend James Leggy from Princeton University who studied Chinese character script and the concepts of the Bible in your language. May God bless you as you reflect on the contents of this message, that it is embedded in your language. And I thank God for the Chinese. Amen.